box if you want to watch it there. Three, two, one, yeah, that's live there. Good. Uh, <laughs> good morning. Uh, I mean, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this little um, talk that Martin Muller agreed to, uh, to, uh, to, to do for us. Uh, it's about React. I'm really, I'm really glad he accepted to, to do this for us. Um, it, I must confess that React uh, is a framework that I personally didn't work with, but I see more and more use, at least in Romania and probably worldwide. So it's the, that other framework that is used besides Angular, at least in my part of the world, that's how it feels. And I'm really looking forward to this talk. And without, other, without losing much more of your time, Martin, the stage is yours. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. And, and glad everyone uh, for joining. Thank you so much. Even from Mexico, I saw in the chat, good morning, Mexico, and good evening, Bucharest, of course. My name is Martin Mulders. I work uh, for a Dutch consultancy company called InfoSupport. Uh, we do a lot of consultancy projects, also a lot of other things, by the way, but uh, consultancy is one of our main uh, topics. And today, as Victor already said, I want to speak with you about React. And uh, the screen should be visible by now. It's going to be a little bit challenging because the goal is to be discussing React in 50 minutes. And we'll see by the end of this talk if that uh, was an, uh, a realistic goal or not. So uh, React, I would say it's, it's uh, an amazing piece of technology uh, and, and I would even gladly give the uh, awesome sauce approval seal for it. So without further ado, what are we going to discuss? Uh, I'm going to give you a quick head start in JavaScript uh, because um, especially if you haven't been to the front end area recently, quite a few things may have changed since you last wrote um, JavaScript code. Um, if you have got any questions, please drop them uh, either in the chat or on YouTube and uh, Victor will direct those questions to me at the end of the talk. So let's get going. What is React? React is a library uh, and you may know it's uh, originally envisioned by Facebook, but now it's, it's maintained by a large uh, open source community worldwide that lets you build user interfaces in a declarative way using JavaScript and optionally using XML. XML, you say, this is 2021. Why not JSON or even JAML? Well, we'll see that in a minute. So React is about declaratively building it. That means it's different than uh, what you may be used to from other user interface toolkits, which are often more um, uh, in an imperative way, create a new button, create a new panel, add the button to the panel, uh, and then add the panel to the screen. That's not how React work, works. React lets you focus on what you want to see, and you let React figure out how to achieve that. So how does React compare to other popular choices in the front-end world? Well, the first major difference that you will see is that React does not give you a way to achieve two-way data binding. Two-way data binding is the process where if you change something in your web application in the browser, uh, the memory model for your JavaScript process gets immediately updated and vice versa. That's not what React does for you. React gives you one-way data binding. You change something in memory, the screen gets updated automatically, but not the other way around. Second thing that React gives you is uh, that where React differs from others is that there's no templating language. Many people will argue that JSX is a templating language, but in fact, it's not, and we'll see why. So there's no custom parsing of templates, which may lead to performance issues if your templates are, are uh, malperforming. There's no scripts interpolation thingy. We'll see that in a minute from now. Next thing is that React really focuses on the user interface. There's no stuff for routing inside your single page application. There's no built-in HTTP client. There's a lot of things that you may uh, be used to from let's say AngularJS that gets shipped out of the box. React does not do that. It focuses on the user interface. Funny fact, by the way, is that it can even be used to build other types of user interfaces than just web applications. 
for instance, you can use it to build native applications for your mobile phone, but even read only user interfaces such as a PDF file. React requires plain JavaScript and nothing else. All the other things that you will often see in blog posts is optional. That even applies to JSX. And it also applies to TypeScript. By the way, if you start building more serious applications with React, I highly recommend to take a look at TypeScript as well. And finally, React leverages a concept that they call the virtual DOM. And that's what you operate upon rather than the actual DOM where DOM obviously is the document object model that we know from the web browser, by the way. So that virtual DOM gives you a huge performance benefit and we'll see where that shines. As I said, we'll start with a short intro of modern JavaScript. I'm going to give you a few snippets of code and see what you can do with JavaScript nowadays. Maybe this is already known to you, then that's just fine, no problem. But just to be sure that we're all on the same page before we dive into the more advanced stuff. The first thing is that JavaScript uh, is now a language that lets us really use object-oriented programming, which includes the use of classes. In the days past, we would use function prototypes, which look ugly, which are hard to understand. We don't need to do that anymore. We can just create an instance of the amount class, supply some constructor params, and invoke a method on it. And if we do that, we see exactly what we well, more or less might expect to happen, we see that we invoke a method on the instance of the class and that the output is exactly as we expect. As you can see, by the way, um, this is just code that's uh, being run immediately so that allows us to go through the samples really quickly rather than having to switch between the uh, presentation and between the editor every two seconds. Second thing in JavaScript is, of course, the use of functions, and you will use them a lot in React. Uh, this is the traditional way of writing a function in JavaScript. And uh, we all can predict what happens if we invoke a function. We get the output, uh, number 42 is an even number. But in JavaScript, we can also write arrow functions. And that's actually a very popular way to do it in JavaScript nowadays. It's a little bit shorter. It works obviously the same including syntax uh, errors that I can make. And if a function is really short, you can actually make it a bit more compact by inlining it and omitting the curly braces. This is all equivalent as far as the JavaScript engine is concerned. There are all functions that we can invoke with a parameter. So far, so good. Uh, another thing that we often use inside React is object decomposition. What we see here is that in the first line, we create an object, uh, we assign it a few properties, and in the second line, we decompose that object, which is called person, into local variables. And we can then use those variables as if they were just there. The name of the variable must match the property inside the object, and this allows us to quickly, well, tear a object into pieces. Uh, if we don't declare, a property, it will also not be present. So the occupancy wasn't decomposed, we can't refer to it. The same works for arrays. We can use array decomposition. We can ask for the first or the second element, works all fine. The third one is not decomposed. There's no local variable with that name. And as such, we don't see any output. The opposite of object decomposition is the object shorthand notation, which lets which lets us create an object using local variables without having to repeat the name of the property and the name of the variable. It was the same if we wrote this, like so, and we can inspect it using the JSON stringify. We see that the object has two properties, name and age, but we can actually omit this if the name of the variable is the same as the name of the property in the object, which is pretty convenient if we want to quickly cre create an object. So uh, another very powerful feature that you will see uh, used a lot is string interpolation. String interpolation lets us create a string uh, by inserting some variables here and there. 
combined with fixed pieces of the string, like so. Doesn't really make sense to include a minus there, but you get the idea. Let's you quickly create some text without having to do manual string concatenation plus quote. Did I actually close that quote correctly or did I not? Don't worry about that. So having said that, it's time to dive into the basics of what JSX is because I've mentioned the name JSX already a few times, but I haven't actually shown you a single piece of JSX until now. So what is JSX? It's a syntax extension to the existing language of JavaScript. And the syntax extension lets us use XML as a literal value rather than a string of characters that happens to look like XML. So we can use XML variables and they are a type in, the, in JavaScript. Uh, the power uh, of XML, like uh, nesting and attributes and all that kind of stuff is still there. You can still use that. And you can even embed an expression inside, uh, inside a, a JSX expression. That's all very cool. Uh, maybe even the coolest thing is that it has built in XSS prevention. So you would say, hey, that's, that's nice, that's JSX, but what if I embed some, some variable that tries to insert even more XML, well, by default, it will not make it into the actual document object model. There is a workaround for that, obviously, because otherwise you could not build certain technology, uh, certain features. That workaround, I still don't know it from heart. Uh, so the chances that you will be using that by accident are really, really low. Uh, the syntax is just so hard, you can't uh, remember it, and you need to look it up every single time. But be aware that there are limitations to this prevention. Philip de Rijk has an excellent talk, uh, which you can find online, where he shows that there still are ways to work around this uh, in a more sophisticated way. It's not bulletproof, but at least it gives you the basics. Now, browsers don't understand this syntax extension. And that's why we need some kind of process, which we call transpilation which is a mix up of transforming and compilation. And that's what transpilation lets us uh, replace this JSX at build time to plain old JavaScript without XML so that every browser and every runtime can actually understand it. And in React until version 17, uh, that means that every JSX ex expression will be replaced by, a, in, by an invocation of react.createElement. So what is a JSX element? This is our most basic example where a JSX element is just the same as the corresponding document object model element. As, as you can see, there's just uh, div slash div. There's no quotes around it. So this is really not a string. Um, and I can put some text in between like so. Hello, Bucharest. I'm not sure if the pronunciation is 100% correct, but at least you got the idea. Um, and the next thing that we need to do if we have a JSX element is that we need to render it using React. That's why we have React DOM.render. We pass it the root of our application uh, and we pass it a document object model uh, location where we want the application to start, which in our case is a is just an element in the DOM, which we find by looking it up uh, using the app identifier. So that's all nice and fine, but it's a little bit boring. It's not really exciting yet. Um, it's good to know that uh, since it's XML, we can use attributes. Uh, those attributes can be strings like here, and you won't see any difference compared to the previous example. Uh, but you will see some little differences, for instance, when you want to load some CSS. Uh, if you want to apply styling to an element, you don't say uh, div class is whatever, you need to name it class name. The attribute is class name. Class in itself is a reserved keyword in React after all. And that means that we can't use it wherever we feel like it. So class name, is the way to uh, load a CSS class. Uh, 
And to make things a little bit complicated, let's add some blue text, which actually is red text, but that should not be of a big surprise at this point. So uh, still being rendered fine. And you see that class name in our JSX gets translated into a CSS class, uh, uh, in, into a, a DOM class attribute that lets us load the red text style. But apart from string literals, we can also use basically every JavaScript value as an attribute. So here we create an object first. Uh, we give it two properties, color is red and font weight is bold. And then rather than passing a string to the style, we pass using curly braces, a JavaScript literal, which is an object. And we pass that to the div element as an attribute. And then again, we're trying to write some blue text. And again, we fail miserably because the text appears to be red. Note, by the way, that if you do your styling this way, uh, well, it's of course very fine grained, but it's also hard to reuse. Uh, you need to be aware of subtle differences like this one. Font weight is not font dash weight, but it's font capital W weight. That's just a subtle thing. There's a whole list online where you can find all the differences, but really uh, that's a little bit outside of the scope for tonight. So next thing is that if we are going to render a React application, we must follow the rules. And one of the rules is that we can only render a single root node. In this example, we have two root nodes, which is not allowed. Now there's two things we can do about this. We can put them in an array and React will be smart enough to figure, hey, if it's an array, then maybe you just want to render the two of them. We can also put them inside a React fragment. And then we don't need the comma over there. And then we need to, of course, close that React fragment. That's all, not all fine. And then maybe you think, well, react.fragment, that's a lot of typing. Well, I totally agree with you. So that's why there's a shorthand notation for React fragments, which lets you use an empty XML tag. And that's not a tag with no children. That's a tag with no name. This is where JSX, by the way, differs from XML. I've never seen this in any XML file. And it probably isn't allowed either. But it's good to know there are a few ways to work around this. So we've seen elements so far. It's time to look at components. Now, a component is basically a JavaScript function. And here we see it's in its most compact notation, which is an array, an arrow function without the curly braces even, that optionally takes some arguments and then returns an element. And I'm saying arguments, but by some weird convention, React always meant, uh, calls them props. Yeah, yeah. And that's a bit uh, confusing, maybe because props is an object, as we will see in a minute. And props have props, because an object in JavaScript has properties. So the props has props, which is very hard in the wording, but yeah, you'll have to bear with me. It doesn't really matter. You can actually call it anything, but here it's just props. We see it's a function greeter that takes an argument, returns a JSX element. And now rather than passing that function to react on dot render, we pass an element of type greeter. It's important to note here that if you are going to start writing components, they must by convention start with a capital, with an uppercase letter. That's how React knows, hey, this greeter is not something that my browser is aware of, or actually my runtime could also be, for instance, a native application on your phone, but let's forget about that. Um, so there must be a function somewhere in my code base that tells me how to render a greeter. The div here, on the other hand, starts with a lowercase letter, and that's how React knows, well, I best try to delegate this to the browser. It may know pretty well how to actually render a div. And as you might guess, well, let's read Mexico as well, because it's not every day that we have Mexicans in the, in the call. Um, uh, as you might guess, if I update the component, then uh, the component gets uh, rendered again. 
And we'll see in a few minutes why that is actually a very powerful property. So, so far so good. We've covered the basics of uh, JSX. Now it's time to look into the more real world examples of what we can do with JSX. And the first thing is that we can actually embed expressions in JSX. I already mentioned that in the intro. And we typically do that by enclosing them in curly braces. So here I can just say a literal text. Works better if you properly escape it, by the way. Yeah. Probably like this. Yeah, something like this. Uh, but that's not cool. It's way cooler to say the answer is 42 because uh, we all know that the answer to the ultimate question of life, universe, and everything is actually 42. Now, this is a literal value that I can paste here. I can also use a variable if I happen to have that in scope. It does exactly the same thing. I can even invoke a function here and have the return value of that function embedded again as an expression inside my JSX. And again, we see every time that the method uh, that gives us the JSX element gets updated, we immediately re-render the whole application. And this is basically that one-way data binding that I told you about. The fact that if I change something in my memory, whether it's in the code or in the memory itself, my components will get updated. Changing your code and then having the application updated is, by the way, something you typically don't do in production. It's continuous delivery to the max, but let's not go there. Uh, let's rather say that's very powerful if you start developing. So I also uh, mentioned already that we can have arguments or properties. And here's an example of that. I have my props variable over there, which is the one object that my component receives. And we will see that if we look at that object, it contains a property called name, and the value is equal to whatever I put in here. And that means that I can change the component. I can even say Mexico City. That also works, obviously. And again, React takes care of the fact that the the value of the property changes, and then the component gets re-rendered immediately. Again, that's the one-way data binding in action. Now, here comes a neat trick. You can use object decomposition in combination with those arguments. So rather than saying, I have props, I can say, I have an object. My method receives an argument. That argument is an object. That object will have a name property. And I can have that as a local variable immediately. And then I don't have to type props.name, but I can just say name. This is especially interesting if your component is a little bit bigger and it has some nested elements and, and whatnot, because then you won't see in one blink of the eye, hey, what exactly am I taking from those props? But if you decompose it like this in the, in the declaration of the component, it becomes more obvious. The code becomes more self-documenting as to what you expect. But again, if you're writing bigger applications, then seriously consider to use TypeScript because TypeScript takes away even more of that burden for you by making that type an explicit thing rather than something that follows from the implementation here. Another cool thing we can do inside JSX is that we can apply uh, control statements. So we can actually uh, make decisions inside our JSX. Here I'm passing a prop called happy. And inside the show emotion uh, component, I'm checking the happy pro uh, variable. If I'm happy, I'll render the clap hands. Otherwise, I'll render the, the dry tears method. And as soon as I change that, then obviously the other component gets rendered. And if we can do by, uh, if we can do if thens this way, then there's probably also a way to do looping. That's right. There's also a way to do looping. And here we see a very simple example of that. I've created a ticker list. I'm passing it 
as uh, using props, an array of uh, some tickers that I want to check for their price, for instance. Both are famous Dutch companies. I'm curious if you know which ones they are and let me add a third one. You will see that the whole application gets updated. Why is that? Because the ticker list is basically a function that takes its one argument, maps each element using the supplied function over there, and then returns that. The return value of that is an array. And as we already saw before, you can safely render an array. Now that function needs a little explanation. It takes the symbol. Symbol here is each individual element from the array. And it invokes that method that we pass on line number four using that value. Well, the value is HAIA uh, or FIA or ASML. And it re uh, returns the value of this expression, which is an element in itself. And it refers to the ticker component, but we use it as an element over there. And that's how we end up with a list of free ticker symbols. If we would decide to update the ticker list a little bit, then all three elements immediately get updated. So we've got that out of the way. Um, if you're any, anything like me, you are by now pretty curious, how does that work? How does React know when to update stuff? Uh, how, how does it translate that XML that the browser doesn't understand into the document object model that the browser does understand? So let's dive in. The magic happens basically at two, in, at two points in time. First, it happens at build time. Uh, what we see at build time is that uh, either Babel or the TypeScript compiler will actually take those JSX expressions like the greeter or the ticker list and transpile them. I already said that's, that's transforming slash compiling into statements that look like react.create element. In our example of the greeter with a prop name with the value world would roughly translate into react.create element greeter that's a reference to the function that will return the element at runtime. Second argument is the whole props in one object. <clears throat> and finally, null, because this element has no children. If the element would have had children, then we would see nested invocations to react of create element inside. That's the first piece of magic. And that's relatively easy to understand, if you ask me. The second thing is a bit harder to understand. So we're spending a little bit more time on that as well. If we load this application in a web browser, then obviously all those react.create element invocations are going to be executed. And the return value of that create element method is an object. And that object is all those objects together form one big tree of objects. And those objects actually represent the virtual DOM, you could say. So that's kind of a shadow administration of what the the document object model in the web browser should look like. React will take that shadow administration. It will take the actual document object model that your browser currently has, and it will start comparing these two with each other. And if it sees that there's a difference, then it will make the right document object model calls to actually make sure the actual DOM is in sync with the virtual DOM. This process is called reconciliation. It reconciles the virtual document object model with the actual do document object model. And it does so by um, actually working on two major assumptions. And we must know about these assumptions because otherwise we are quickly going to create applications that don't work properly. The first that we need to be aware of is that if two elements for instance, uh, one in the virtual DOM and one in the new virtual DOM, because we are re-rendering our applications, have a different type, then React will say, okay, the whole subtree is probably going to be different. That's just the assumption we're making here. And the second is that if we have uh, an element which, which has child elements and those child elements have the same type, 
how do we keep them apart from each other? We need a key prop to do that. Let's dive in. The first is about uh, elements of a different type. As you can see here, I have a very multilingual application, which does a very interesting uh, business problem. It greets you in your language of choice. Uh, I didn't prepare for any Mexican guests. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, so you'll have to deal with uh, English in this case. I could change the language to English and you will see the text changes and the flag icon changes as well. Uh, and obviously this also works for Romanian. I think it's something like, hey, that you would say. Thank you, Victor, for confirming this. Makes my day. Uh, but how does that work? It works because um, let's say that we started with NL and then by some user action, it's changed to RO. First, we had a virtual DOM that said, hey, please make me a Dutch greeter. And inside the Dutch greeter, there's a div with the flag icon for the Netherlands and the text hello. And as soon as we change that, we see a different type because Dutch Greeter and Romanian Greeter are not of the same type. They're different functions after all. So different function, I'm going to assume that this whole div and everything that's under there, including that text and that piece of text as well, that we can get rid of it. We can just throw that away and we can replace that with a new piece of the document object model. If this, this assumption would not be there, then React would need to dive into the whole subtree as well, comparing that as well, which would be a very inefficient way to probably find out, well, there is something to change or maybe there's not something to change. This is just the assumption that we're making and that helps us to quickly and effectively decide which part of the document object model need an update or, more importantly, do not need an update because if the elements have the same type, then we can keep them and doing no document object manipulation is of course the most cheap thing to do. As we all know, document object uh, manipulation in the browser is a relatively expensive operation. The second thing is about that key prop that I told you about. So here's our ticker list again, and I've added a little thing in the fourth line over there. There's an additional prop that I'm passing here. It's the key prop. That key prop helps React determine, let's say if I add a second one in between, helps us determine that Fia and Haya were the same as before. They don't need to be updated. They can just stay inside document object model and only this one's going to be new and hence it will decide to insert something in between those other. If we would not have this option, then React could not do anything else than remove all of these stickers and recreate them all. That would be very inefficient. By passing this key, React can determine, hey, it's the same one as before. Let me just keep that one. There's uh, two important rules that we must obey for this key. It must be stable and it must be unique. So for any given symbol, the key must be unique. I can't have two symbols with the same uh, key because then it would be hard for React to tell which one is which one. And also they must, they must be stable because this is all about re-rendering our application based on user re input or user action. If it would not be stable, then every time we re-render the application, the ticker would be considered new anyway. And that would mean that we would throw away the old one and recreate the new one only to find out that nothing has changed. Again, very inefficient. So that's all cool. Uh, we can build a basic application. Now we could sketch out our user interface declaratively, figure out what it would look like, but our application would basically not do anything. We want a way to interact with our environment. And I'm going to take you through four typical use cases that you often see in web applications. The first one is storing state inside a component. So here I have a counter element, which is supposed to be, well, a counter, obviously. And it has some state. It has an actual value 
uh, which is zero in this case. I could also assign it 42, doesn't really matter. Um, and by uh, saying react.use state, I get back an array and the array has two elements. The first element is the actual value that I want to have stored. And the second argument is a function that lets me update that count. You may be wondering, why is that? How are we going to use that? Well, to see that, we must know how we can react to user events. As a quick aside, event handling in React is pretty much equal to how it works in the, in the browser itself, but there's a few things that you need to be aware of that are different. Event names are camel cased, so it's on click with a capital C rather than with a lowercase c. The event handler is always a function. You can't simply use an event handler by its name in React. An event handler is also never a global function. You always bind it to the component. And finally, the event handler doesn't receive the native browser event. It receives a synthetic event, which makes sure that the event looks exactly the same in all browsers. I'm looking at you, Internet Explorer. So what does that look in practice? Uh, here's our react.use state example again. I've, I still display the, the value of the counter there, and I have also added two buttons. The button has an on click prop over there, and the uh, on click prop refers to a function. The function is just a local function here inside my component. See, it's, see how this, this can never escape the component, this will never lead to a memory leak or something. And that function can actually do things when I click on that button. For instance, it could say that I want the counter to change, like so. And now if I click that button, oh, it's almost as if it was magic. So Victor, I remember you had a soundboard. If you would want to uh, use the applause button, that this would be a good moment uh, as far as I'm concerned because this is of course the, the most epic business functionality that you ever need to build. So the function that we get as a second uh, argument over there lets us modify the state, but this state will only live inside the component. If the component is removed from the page, the state is gone. We'll see later what to do about that. We can do a more or less similar thing using change callbacks, for instance. So here we have a text input. The text input has an on change callback. If that change event happens, the update name method is being invoked. We can look at the target of the event, which is actually the div itself, uh, the input itself, ask its value, and then use that to invoke the set name function. The button has an on click again, and the on click has a callback. The callback uses string interpolation. And let's just say, hey, name. Um, and now I can do a shout out to Victor. And yeah, I hope it's visible. But up there in the top of the screen, we see the pop up uh, that, the, that actually proves that it works. So change callbacks let us also react to the fact that the user typed something, for instance. And that's, of course, a very common use case. Now, another thing that you often want to do if you build web applications is fetch data over an HTTP wire. Uh, as I said, React doesn't provide anything for this out of the box, but browsers have been modernized as well. And that means that every modern browser nowadays knows about the fetch method. That's kind of a standard overall web browsers, how to do an HTTP call. So we're going to do a little bit of gluing together of some plain old JavaScript uh, to actually fetch data. And then we can have a component to show us the data that we fetched. So a pattern that I often follow when I start building applications like this is that I write a function that lets me focus on what I want to achieve. In this case, I have a serverless function somewhere running in, uh, in the Oracle Cloud, which gives me a random joke. Now, there's a I'm going to write a function, get joke. First thing I need to do is do a get on that address. 
if that succeeds, that means we got any data at all, then we will check the status. And if the status is somewhere in the 200 range, then we can resolve the JavaScript promise. Otherwise, we can reject it. Uh, a resolve promise means here's the data that I promised you earlier, whereas a rejected promise is, yeah, I promised to give you some data, but no, I'm not going to do it. Next step is to actually extract the data from the response using the .json method, gives us a new promise. And then finally, we want to inspect that object. Well, the object has a field called joke, and that's the actual thing that I'm looking for. Great, how can I use this? <clears throat> Here I have another component. It has a little bit of state. It has a Boolean that uh, keeps track of whether I'm actually loading data at this point. And it has the joke itself. And here I'm, I'm using array decomposition to decompose the array into two uh, local variables. And then I'm decomposing the object into two other local variables. So the effect of this is that I have three local variables, joke, loading, and set state. Here I have a function. The function is going to be invoked using react.use effect. It will just call the fetch random joke function. Use effect means I'm going to apply this effect when the component loads. And by passing an empty array over there, I'm making sure that it only fires when the component initially loads. If I pass additional variables inside this array, I'm basically declaring um, a requirement. So, uh, that, that would be helpful to say, hey, if something changes, some local variable changes, then run this effect again. But we don't need that today. So uh, the fetch random joke function is there. And what we will do if we got our joke, we will call set state and we will say loading is false. And the joke is a text of the joke that we just received. And there you have it, your random dead joke. Um, and just to prove uh, it gets refreshed. There we have another one. And okay, just for fun and giggles, that's the third one. There you go. So that's how you can do basic HTTP calls. And obviously you can write this glue code as well for post or for put, you can pass parameters along to such a get joke function, but that's all a bit outside of the scope for tonight. So we store data inside a component. Can we actually persist it over time? Yes, of course we can. What we can do, we can store data inside the browser using local storage or session storage. Both of them follow the web storage API. Again, that's a cross browser standard. So that makes it makes it very easy for us to make sure that it will work in every major browser. But the web storage API only lets you store strings. And that's a bit of a pitfall that you need to be aware of. If you want to store an object or you want to load an object, you need to either serialize it using Stringify or to deserialize it using JSON parse. Great. Uh, as I said, there's local storage and there's session storage. Session storage is just for the time that your web application is active in the browser. If you close the tab, if you close the browser, the session storage is wiped. Um, if that's not long enough to store your data, there's local storage, which will even survive a browser shutdown. That's the very basic. And of course, there's many more ways to do it. But this is what you can do with just React and nothing else. Now, we've built an amazing application. We're ready to ship it to shine on the interwebs. How are we going to do that? Well, we often need a bit of debugging before we are at that point. Uh, we maybe want to add some testing to the mix as well. And then finally, we are going to build that application. For debugging, I highly recommend to install the React developer tools, which among other things, give you a nice tree-like visualization of all the React components in your application. It's really a can't miss if you're doing React development. It also gives you uh, uh, source maps uh, so that you can actually see the original source code that you wrote inside the 
debugger of your browser and that's including the JSX that you may have written on your disk, but that's obviously not what the browser sees usually. Then you might want to test your components because they're part of your application after all. And for that, we use Jest and the React testing libraries. And what they let you do is they, uh, you, you give them a React component and you can render it inside a test and then make assertions about the outputs and behavior of that component. Very simple example here. I'm going to render the greeter that I created earlier and I'm uh, using the render function for that. And then I can write expectations like these. I can say, well, I expect that there's going to be a text somewhere, hello, Bulgarest. It's case insensitive. I don't care about uh, casing at this point, uh, but I expect that text to be visible somewhere on the screen. If that's not the case, my component isn't working correctly. And in a similar way, you can even uh, verify if all the callbacks work correctly. So here I'm creating a, a dummy function using just.mock. I'm passing that as the callback to my awesome source button over there. Now, if I figure out which part of the rendered component I want to have, well, that's done using screen.get a component by role. Then I can fire an event on that one, a click event in this case, and then I expect my callback to have been invoked. If that's not the case, my awesome button is not as awesome as it claims to be. And then I'd better write a new one. Now, if you want all this, and as, uh, as I said, any serious software development process probably needs things like these, then I highly recommend you take a look at Create React App. Create React App is basically an assembly of all the best practices that have been developed over the last few years by companies that use React in production. And it leverages existing tools such as Webpack, Babel, and a dozen of other tools. It wires them up in the correct way to work together. It lets you hot reload your code as you type, you immediately see the effect of your changes in the web browser, gives you debugging and whatnot. And it also gives you a way to build a minified version of your application ready to ship to production. You install it using the node package manager or using yarn, and then you invoke it by saying create react app followed by the name of your application. And in more recent versions, you can even scaffold out a new application to immediately start using TypeScript just by adding one uh, switch to that command. Then the most frequently used things using create react app is npm run start, build and test which you use to start developing to, to create a production build or to run your unit tests. Now, there's a few more topics. Looking at the clock, it's probably better to skip most of them. Um, you can write your own custom hooks, um, but let's not dive into that one right now. Um, because I want to go to the wrapping up and give you some time to shoot your questions at me. So if you're going to do React application development, I highly recommend, again, uh, to use Create React App because that saves you the, the pain of creating your, your Webpack build and, and making sure it works properly. That's, that's really, it's not fun to do that yourself. I've tried it, I've done that, and it's not fun. Um, it really pays off to think of your application as a collection of components, uh, the smaller the better, I would say, and to focus on reusability of those components. And finally, uh, I recommend you to start thinking in a declarative way. So focus on how you want your user interface to look like rather than uh, how to actually achieve that because that's what React shines it doesn't let you create it, it lets you declare what you want to have and then it will take care of creating it. If you want to dive further, there's a few useful links at the bottom of the page. I see one of them fell off a little bit. I'll make sure to uh, have that corrected in the slides that I'll be sharing later tonight. For now, I want to thank you. Um, let me take a look at the clock. 50 minutes, Victor, I think we managed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On the spot, right there. Excellent. Any questions? Yes, there were some. Uh, I'll begin with the complex one. Um, 
the I've also heard about this debate, but perhaps you can tell us more. It um, it talks about components, parent-child components. If you want a child component to notify a parent component, the container component about something interesting. How do mm -hmm. humans propagate from child components to parent components? And there are, uh, um, according to Emmanuel, two approaches in this. One is uh, a functional style approach in which the parent sends to the child a yep. callback function. Exactly. And then another one, which is going for the object-oriented style in which you actually have mutations. And I, I don't know much about this one. I only used it. I only heard about the function. The OOP would mean what? To have the child component um, putting his finger in the state of the parent? Or how does this work? If you, uh, I, I, myself, I, I typically use callbacks uh, for the simple reason that it's, it's simple. Uh, so conceptually, it doesn't make me think too much. Uh, I hate that. Um, so uh, a, a callback, uh, that's indeed, that's a function the parent will give to the child. Basically a way for the parent to, uh, of, for the child to update the parent. And that function can uh, update a little bit of state inside the parent, for instance. But it should, of course, not allow to update all of the state. It should only allow to update the relevant parts of the state. It's not a way to say, oh, well, yeah, sure, you can update each and every part of me, and I'm totally fine with that. So I would say fi fine-grained callbacks that let you focus on a particular thing. Hey, customer info changed, but I don't let you touch the order info, of course, because that's none of your business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, interesting actually uh, first the parent component that wants to use the child one uh, the callback function will be defined in the parent component yeah so for sure for, for when thinking about the child component you don't need to be concerned about how your parents how your about what callback with your parent will give you so that also keeps things nice to, together yeah. in the single responsibility yeah. So, so the, the child component declares the callbacks that it's willing to accept, the callbacks that it's willing to receive and uh, decides when to call them. And the parent can also supply, of course, a dummy callback saying, yeah, oh, it's required, but I don't care. Yes, the right. And then it will just be an empty callback. Makes perfect sense. Um, I think for this moment, the cycling function of calling components. Um, I'm not sure what, what Octavia wants to meant here. I think for this is more to think about cycling function calling components. Uh, Tavian, if you can rephrase it, please. So how would you, um, how easy would it be uh, to migrate your app from React to React Native? In <laughs> that's no, a yeah. question. I, I often get, uh, if, if you would let me uh, for a minute, and, and, then, and then we'll go back to the previous one. Um, it really depends. Uh, yeah, sorry to say that. <laughs> um, Eventually, a component delegates to native components of that platform, right? So uh, somewhere at the end of the day, I'm seeing div and I'm seeing input. Those things simply don't exist on mobile. Uh, so that, that means somewhere we need to build a layer of abstraction. Um, business logic, validations, that kind of stuff, you could probably a reuse without too much effort, just throw them in a separate MBM package and you're good to go. But the actual user interface, not that easy. By the way, uh, I'm curious if there's so much overlap between a web application and a native application. I don't know about you, my screen isn't that big. Uh, my MacBook, on the other hand, has a rather big screen and there's not much use to reuse, there's not much practical use of reusing the user interface because they are different form size. Yes, of course. You want a different layout probably on that small phone. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I have the voice now. Uh, can you hear me? So I was referring to the parent-child uh, callbacks. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, there to not to be a uh, cycle uh, function definition. You know, because then, uh, so it's about it's about the design when when you think in React. You should not think as uh, 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 Martin said uh, in templates like we used to 
but to think in reusable components. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you, you have a good design and uh, use the great uh, features for that uh, you present. Yeah. You, you yeah. basically well, see a risk that the callback will call back into the child. Right, Cause, causing a re-render of the child. Yeah, that's that's something that that could happen a lot in, for instance, Angular JS. If you're old en enough to have lived that, I, I unfortunately am old enough for that, and I still have nightmares every now and then. Uh, it's not that likely to happen in React because typically a callback is something that happens in reaction to the user doing something. If I re-render a React component, that doesn't mean the user starts doing something. So in the normal circumstances, I would not expect rendering a component to automatically call a callback function. Yeah, right. And that's the, that's the kind of thing, if you would do that, look, it's not forbidden. But you will, you, you, you might, and you probably will run into trouble indeed. Uh, but typically, the render function of a component should be short in execution time, and it should, and that's a very important thing. It should not have side effects. Uh -huh. Calling a call, invoking a callback function, I would argue, is a side effect. Does not belong there. We have React.use effect for that. That's uh -huh. why it's yeah. called effect. It's side effects of the rendering. It's not something that you want to happen during the rendering phase itself, because that's when the, the screen glitters and blinks. You want, to, you want it to happen afterwards. But that, that user effect will tell React to run that, because the, the joke example, it got a new joke every time. So that means that user effect will, when will React call the user effect, basically? If you pass an empty array like it did in the example, yes. only when the component gets rendered the first time. If you pass, uh, let's say, uh, you can create an inf infinite loop there. If you pass joke as a dependency to the effect, then every time the joke changes, the effect gets rerun, which changes the effect, which causes the effect to run again, which updates the state. Joke gets rendered again, uh, gets updated. Hey, let me rerun that effect for you. It's cycle. Basically. And then there you have your cycle. But... And I've actually made that mistake once or twice and wondered why it took so long to for the application to load. It turned out, looking at the uh, the network tab of the of the, the debugger, hey, it's doing that call over and over again. I see why every time I fetch the user details, I start fetching them again. And when I'm done, I start fetching them again. Interesting. Very yeah, but that's 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 what the empty array is for. Uh, and and it, the only thing is that if, if inside that effect you change something, it should typically not be in the dependencies array. Fair enough. And that be, I'm, I'm referring to, uh, let, let, me, let me quickly yeah, go okay. back. I'm referring to. Um, Here. Yeah, to that empty array over there. <laughs> I, that I, one, I, I that was one. puzzled with that when I saw it. Now it makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Good. So, one more thing, um, uh, you said that from a render to call in, to call uh, a callback into the parents is not typical, but you could imagine probably easier uh, a case in which in response to a callback from a child, the parent re-renders the child. That is yeah. easier to, 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 to imagine. Like for example, checking a checkbox in the child and then the child becomes read only or something like that. Yeah, okay. then it will disappear. You, yeah, disappear, or, or it will be basically yeah. rendered. Yeah. Okay. But okay. but then rendering it again and then having it crossed out, for instance, hey, imagine a typical to-do application. Hey, I've got right. my task done. Check the box. It gets crossed for, crossed out. That will re-render it. But just rendering it should not invoke a callback. Clicking that checkbox. That's when the callback happens. And that happens parents, once, yeah. only when you do it. Yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. OK. Uh, one last thing I, I, um, I, I got um, when you said uh, when you uh, the comparing the reconciliation between the virtual DOMs, you said mm -hmm. if you uh, if the new DOM that gets recreated, they have uh, React encounters a different type of object, a different component. 
Yeah. It will not look deeper, but it will just overlap. It. But I, it wasn't clear in that moment if what happens if the two components have the same time? Then what? It will scan deeper for different. It will, yeah. It will go think... one level deeper uh, until it finds out, hey, I'm done. There's there's no deeper level. Uh, or until it finds something that has a different type, and then it will start the uh, the throwing away and recreating part on that. Or level. as you mentioned, if there was an array change, you can insert or remove items dynamically, or with yeah. the goal of not rendering much of DOM every time, right? Minimizing yeah. the all right. Yeah, it's all it's all targeted at doing as few document object model manipulation as possible because that's way more expensive than doing a little bit of memory shuffling around with objects. That virtual DOM is cheap to update. The actual DOM is expensive to update. Yes, yes. And I guess a lot of React complexity is in that part, really, because that yeah. quite... Yeah. What is actually funny to mention in that regard, um, that they had a, a, a first version of this, and that it turned out that there were a few design issues in there. It didn't... Yeah, it works, but yeah, it, it would prevent further development of React. <clears throat> and then between React 15 and 16, if I'm not mistaken, they rewrote the whole internal part of React. Whoa. Literally the whole internal stuff. But the external API was 95% stable. My God. That, 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 and now that, I'm that. looking at you, AngularJS. <laughs> Beat that, Ooh, please. Yes. <laughs> Boom, Angular. indeed. Boom. That's, that's, people were... Uh, were surprised, like like what I can just migrate from yeah, from the, so in, the old yeah. to the new, and it, it doesn't went, hurt me. Yeah, yeah. So much yeah that, 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 and that was also when I really got impressed about the engineering power that that's that's under the hood because you don't see all of that as a React developer, but knowing that they can keep an API stable on this level, well, that's quite an achievement if you ask me. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, one more thing that I was really uh, shocked. Honestly, personally, I didn't know all the features you presented in the JavaScript. I didn't know about fetch works, for example. So mm -hmm. uh, I thought Angular is a must. Okay, dollar HTTP. We don't need to do that. No, actually, it's very easy now. Yeah. Well, uh, whoa, so you already opened my eyes in many, many regards. Thanks a lot. Uh, now I really have a much better picture of, of React and very, very effective, time effective. So, whoa. <laughs> Thank you Thanks so much. A lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot for, for your effort. And you, you, I can see how much work you've put into this presentation. Amazing. You're Thanks welcome. Very much. And uh, maybe, yeah, the, your contact details are around here. Yeah, your Twitter handle. So, folks, if you yep. to, I have it uh, oops, down there. Mm -hmm. That's my Twitter handle, uh, but you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I do maintain a blog, which I have to admit is mostly about Java uh, and also quite a bit about Maven, uh, but there is a few incidental posts about React as well. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, Thank you. Uh, enjoy the evening or enjoy the afternoon if you happen to live in Mexico. Or the morning, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good. All right. Good. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Thanks a lot, Martin. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Bye. Bye.